Psalm 23, verse number one says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Death is not the extinguishing of a light, but it's just the putting out of a lamp because the dawn has come. And today we celebrate the life of Ed Beck, a general, a giant, a friend. And I want to thank you, especially family who's here today, the friends and family that are joining us online, and to the remarkable Frisco Fire Department who has represented this family well. Thank you for being here today. Let's pray. Father, in times like these, we need you more than we realize. We need you more than we can express. So we just ask for you to be present, for your comfort, your peace, your presence to be here and to provide for each and every one of us exactly what we need. We lean upon you in times like this. We trust in you in times like this. And today we call upon you and ask for you to be the ever-present help in our time of trouble. We're here to celebrate Edward Reuben Beck. We're here to celebrate his life to remember the impact that he has upon us. And we ask that, Lord, you would help us to honor this beautiful man in a way that he deserves and honors and glorifies you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to ask Pastor Craig Eidson, son-in-law as well, to come and join me here. There you are, Pastor. Thank you for um, watching online today, and it means so much to the family. On behalf of the family, I want to say thank you for all the flowers and the cards and the gifts and the food and the prayers and more prayers. They need them more than any uh, time in their life this, uh, this time, and so we appreciate that so very much. Um, I'm given the task of reading Ed's obituary, but I don't really like the word obituary. I like kind of a resume, if I could, for his life. And as I'm reading this and as the uh, memorial service goes forward, you may hear uh, some cries from some grandkids or great-grandkids, and I hope they actually do cry out. If you're watching at home, you may hear that. And uh, that's just part of his legacy and that you'll hear and maybe even see in some of the video today, and so he's left a great legacy for all of us to follow, for all the family. And so thank you so, so very much. Let me read this. Edward Reuben Beck, 81, of Plano, Texas, passed away peacefully into the arms of his Savior. On April 21st, 2020, he was surrounded by his loving family. Born February 2nd, 1939, in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. Ed was the son of Chester and Leatrice Beck McWhirter. Ed attended Maysville High School where he was president of the FFA and played quarterback on the Warriors football team. He earned all district, all area, and honorable mention, all state in the sport. And after graduating in 1957, he attended the University of Tulsa on a scholarship to play football for the Tulsa Hurricanes. He remained an ardent football fan for the remainder of his life. On June 1st, 1958, a good year for Ed, he married 
his high school sweetheart and love of his life, Patricia Darlene Christian, and they enjoyed 61 wonderful years together and were blessed with three children. Ed worked in management for Southwestern Bell and AT&T for 35 years before retiring. He received multiple honors as a salesman of the year, but by far his greatest roles were those of husband, father, and child of God. Ed was a member of Freedom Church in Carrollton, Texas for over 30 years, and he served in multiple ministries within the church, including the role of deacon. Ed was an avid OU fan and liked to play golf. He and Darlene loved to travel with friends and family and their church's senior adult group. And most of all, Ed loved his family. He was their greatest cheerleader. Ed is preceded in death by his parents, Chester and Lita Beck, and his brother, Benny Beck. He is survived by his adored wife, Darlene, his three children, Cindy Bray and husband, Randy of Oklahoma City, Michelle Edson and husband, Craig of Piedmont, Oklahoma, and Chris Beck and wife, Deanna of Frisco, Texas, his eight grandchildren, Barrett Bray and wife, Kristen of Edmond, Oklahoma, Cody Edson and wife, Lindsay of Edmond, Oklahoma, Brittany Woodward, and Brian of Oklahoma City, her husband Brian, Tyler DeBerry of Oklahoma City, Heather Fowler and husband Derek of Piedmont, and Parker Dalton and Carson Beck of Frisco, Texas. His 11 precious great-grandchildren, Laney, Crosby, Hattie, Woodward, Everly, Olivia, and Beckett Bray, Zion, Avery, and Stella Edson, and Goldie and Reuben Fowler, and his sister-in-law, Suzanne Christian of Woodward, Oklahoma.
Thank you, Bear. I'm going to ask Cody, Cody, if you would come, and then Barrett, if you would be prepared right after Cody to come and share a few remarks on behalf of the grandchildren. I've heard some great, great stories over the last couple of days, uh, but I would love to hear from you guys. So I was, was I was, I was thinking about how to prepare something for us all today. I was having a difficult time, so, because there's so many things I could say about my granddad. So, what I decided to do is put together a few words that might trigger some memories in everyone's mind, some fond memories of my granddad, Mimi, your beloved husband, Uncle Chris, Aunt Cindy, my mom, your father. I remember my granddad having a passion for football, sitting in his living room on the floor watching games with him. I remember him telling me about his days in football and uh, how incredible he was and how he was a prospect for the Green Bay Packers. I remember him playing catch with me out in his front yard as a toddler because baseball was my passion as a kid. I also remember him reading lots of books and him getting books, you know, for about every birthday or or holiday that we shared together. Um, He was the greatest bookworm I think I ever knew. I remember him waking up in the morning and sitting at the kitchen table, eating breakfast with the grandkids, reading his newspaper. And if he wasn't reading it at the breakfast table, he was in his recliner doing the same. I remember waking up in the morning when I would stay at his house and smelling the fragrance of his aftershave in the morning. I remember him in the evenings playing games with us kids, his grandkids and his kids at the table, whether it be the game of spades or 31, most often times with a bowl of bluebell vanilla ice cream in front of him. I remember sleeping on the sofa bed next to his recliner in the living room as a kid oftentimes and waking up with him sitting right beside me, reading a book or the newspaper or quietly watching the news or weather on the TV. But most of all, I remember him being our biggest fan and our biggest cheerleader in life. I remember him showing up to games that I would play, rooting for me, screaming his, you know, lungs out, losing his voice, cheering me on, And I remember him praying for me, and I remember him encouraging me to do the most important thing I think I've ever done in my entire life. That thing was to read through the book of Proverbs at a very young age. He told me it's the most important book that I could ever read in my entire life, and if there was one book that I should read, that should be it. Because he knew that if I would do that and I would commit myself to it, 
that I would learn of God's superior knowledge and wisdom and plan for my life. And that, in turn, would translate into the life of my family that I've built today, that that would leave a legacy behind that would continue on for generations. And so today, I want to leave you with this, and I'm keeping this short, but I want to leave that same task to each and every one of you in this place and each and every one of you that may be watching today. Seek God's word out. Seek his truth out. And if it just means knowing a book front to back, page after page, verse after verse, and only that one, I know that God will leach into you and he will bring the best out in your life. I know that he'll reveal his love and his passion and his truth to you. And I know that he will encourage you through the words in ways that man cannot. And so the verse that I have for you this morning that I'll leave you with is one of the most profound words from the book of Proverbs that I think we can read and that really applies to this point in our lives. I believe my granddad did this, and I think we could all do it and follow the legacy that he's left us. And this is it. Proverbs 3. Verse 3 through 4. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. I don't believe he ever did that. He loved each and every one of you in here, in this room, and he loved this church greatly. I heard about it time after time. Let love and faithfulness bind around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Amen. My granddad, when I think of him, he's got a great name here inside of me. He was loving. He was charming. He was honoring. But he loved people, and I think he was deeply passionate for people. And that's why he served as a part of this church for so long as a greeter, and as a deacon. He wanted to see people come to know Jesus Christ above all things, above football, watching football, above anything else. He wanted people to know God. And so today I challenge you all to live your life according to this verse. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. And by doing so, you'll win favor with those around you, around you, and you'll win favor with our Christ Jesus. I love you, Granddad, and thank you so much for challenging me to read this book and find these words and inscribe them on my heart. Cody. Now we'll hear from Barrett. I think I made a mistake in telling Cody he could go first. You got me teared up, buddy. Um, I've thought about this day for a long time, as you tend to do as life continues to progress, and I know that we'd be here someday. And um, I thought about what I'd like to say, and I don't know that anything has stuck with me or that I could pick one thing. Just as Cody said, thinking about the things that I would like to say, how can you fill any temporary amount of time with all the things that I'd like to say about Granddad? But as I've been thinking about it over the last few days, one word keeps popping into my mind and it was confirmed for me when you started out this morning, Pastor Kendall, the word that I've been anchoring myself to 
is that my granddad was a giant. Physically, he had a large stature. He was a big guy. But beyond that, his integrity, his determination, in his love and in his power, he towered over the other people in my life. When I think about granddad, there's three things, three character qualities that immediately rise to the top. And again, I could list thousands, but there's three that to me and in my relationship with him defined granddad. I'd like to tell a couple of stories of ways that they exhibited themselves in my life. The first thing I would say about granddad is that he had a quiet power and a gentle strength. I remember a time that Cody and Brittany and I were together. I'm sorry, Mimi, you knew I would tell this story. On our way back from, I don't know if it was a grandkids weekend or if we were just on our way back that we had spent some time with you guys down here on our way to Oklahoma City. And we made the whole trip and he kept his patience with three screaming kids in the back 30 years ago. And as we pulled into the neighborhood, a guy pulled out in front of him and almost caused us to wreck. And immediately, that gentleman turned around and started taunting my grandfather. Well, before I knew it, he was out of the car. And before he knew it, he was back in the car because he forgot to take off his seatbelt. <laughs> and I'll never forget the power that he exhibited in that moment when Mimi looked at him and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm about to kick a man's, we'll, we'll honor granddad today. You can imagine the rest. But he immediately in that moment and in the power that was within him, when he looked back and he saw the three of us sitting in the back, I remember seeing his eyes and seeing the entire level of that amount of power calm. And he came down and he showed me that day what subdued power, what true meekness looks like. The second thing that I would say about granddad is that he loved and protected his family. He loved each of us fiercely, and he always made sure that we knew of the importance that we had in his life. He was willing to fight for us. I am... Um, I hadn't planned on, I, I just thought of this story actually while I was sitting there a few moments ago, but I remember it at Brittany's graduation when we were all gathering together and everybody stood as the graduates made their way around the arena and a man stand, sitting behind me didn't want me to stand up in front of him. He didn't want to stand, so he told me to sit down and I told him, no, we're, this is what we're doing and he continued to tell me to sit down until he started using some words that he couldn't have. And before I could even turn around to address the gentleman, granddad was already standing next to me and backing me up and telling him, this is not the way it's going to be. That's my grandson. It was a fun story for me because it was one of the first times my wife had spent a lot of time with a family and we were just dating at the time. And I had told her, now I'm just going to let you know, there's always some crazy family that's going to start fighting at the graduation far across the arena. I never knew it would be us that day. But granddad showed me his love that day in the way that he stepped in to protect me. Not only that, but echoing what Cody said, he showed his love and his attendance and his engagement with us. Every event that I can remember, every significant event of my life, granddad was there. Ball games and dance recitals, birthday parties and holidays, at every one, he engaged himself, pouring into us and expressing his pride over us, but also his expectations. And that doesn't just go towards the kids and grandkids, but that family that's joined us, going on to Kristen, Brian, Lindsay, Derek. He loved you as you were his as well. And he showed us what a family can look like or what it should look like. The last thing I would say about granddad, and it's probably my favorite of the three, and I think the family would agree that granddad was ornery. He could take 
a situation and make it fun no matter what. And the significance of this isn't just that he liked to have fun and joke, but he had the perfect balance of understanding when a topic should be heavy and how to make it light for the people around him. There was one day when I couldn't have been older than uh, Olivia. I may have been three or four years old, and I remember visiting you, Michelle, and Craig at your home in Springfield, Missouri, and being there, and at some point, someone found a snake in the front yard, and I'll tell you, I don't know how big the snake was, but from my memory at the time, it was at least eight feet long. It was a huge snake. And I was told not to go outside, that they were taking care of it. And by the time I was finally released, Granddad saw me coming, and he picked that snake up and pretend, pretended that it was still alive and swung it like a lasso around his head, screaming at that snake for me. That was a day that my granddad became my superhero. And I will never, ever forget it. Granddad could joke and have fun at any time, especially when it was probably inappropriate, much to Mimi's chagrin. And I'm sorry, Kristen. I think that's something I got from granddad. But he never let a moment pass that he could inspire a smile from anyone around him. And I loved him for that. Now that he's gone and I don't get to see his face in front of me. I've been thinking about the reflections that I see of him and our family. Mom, I see granddad in your gentle kindness and your dedication to God. Michelle, I see granddad in your passion for life and your desire to serve and help others. Chris, I see granddad in your stubbornness. <laughs> We're gonna call it determination but your same ability to make others laugh and have a little bit of an ornery kick to you. And I look forward to the future when I get to see the hundreds of flickers of granddad that will pop up in the rest of us. Cody, Brittany, Tyler, Heather, Parker, Dalton, and Carson. We are carrying on a legacy and we've got a good one to carry with us. My Sunday school teacher and one of my mentors made a comment yesterday that so many times in our culture we tend to quantify our priorities. It's pretty normal to hear someone say that in my life God is first, family is second, and then from there maybe friends or church, your community, your country, your job, however you want to put it in there. That's normal to say, and it's and it's it's commendable to have that kind of dedication. But my pastor told me something that, uh, it's a simple concept, but one that I've never put into words before. And I immediately thought of my granddad when he said it. That more important than quantifying and having one more important than the other and working on a vertical level of your priorities, centralize your priorities. Granddad was centered in his relationship with God and his dedication to Christ. And that made everything else fall into line. With that mentality and with that heart, he did love his family. He served his friends and those around him, and he loved unceasingly. Granted, was a giant. And our giant fell, but not in defeat. My giant fell into the arms of the one who's bigger than him to rest and to be carried to where he gets his reward. I'm going to read one more thing. Brittany wrote a poem that she posted online, and it's printed on the back of your program. And uh, I didn't read it until I had already put this together, and I think it fits very well. Larger than life, he's always loomed in crowded corridor of memory head and shoulders above the rest. Feet running to rescue, hands moving mountains, heart full to bursting with tender ferocity. Three words, she is mine. 
wrap all certain uncertainties in quiet security of belonging. My hero knows no earthly fame, but larger than life, he looms, counting himself wealthy among men. Larger than life, a voice calls, echo in a crowded corridor of present, whisper resounding above the rest, cruel twist of fate, the hero falls, hands, feet, heart falling, sorrow in the shadow lands, three words, not much time. Wrap all fears and urgent grief of story gone wrong. My hero knows no faintness of heart, but larger than life the voice calls. Stilling beat that upheld us all. Larger than death, a promise remains. Confidence in crowded corridor of doubt. Truth throbbing above the rest. Unlikely swap, the hero fell. Feet running to rescue hands moving mountains, heart full to bursting with tender ferocity. Three words, it is finished. Wrap all hope in joyous knowledge of life that is larger. Blessed assurance, my hero knows no earthly pain, but running breakneck, he crosses the line, entering life larger than living. I love you, granddad. Thank you so much, Barrett. Thank you, Cody. Yes. One more? Okay. Yeah. Who's that? Okay. Sorry. Carson, I am so sorry. I didn't get that memo. I'm glad you're going to share. Okay. Um, I don't know why I thought this would be easy, but <laughs> here we go. Everyone knows me. I'm Carson, um, or further known as the baby of all the grandchildren. <laughs> While being the youngest has its disadvantages as that, um, I only got 16 years with granddad. I can still say that I am fortunate to have lived so close to him all of my life. This meant that granddad was lucky enough to sit through hours of cheerleading competitions, my one very unsuccessful season of soccer, and many halftime performances. I think all the grandkids can agree though that no matter what, he was our biggest fan and he made sure that we knew of it. He always wanted to see us pursuing our dreams. I remembered that every time I would see Granddad, he would give me a big hug and ask me how I was doing. If I just replied with good, he would make sure that I knew just good was not good enough. He wanted me to be great. He was the most selfless man I knew. If I told him I was hungry, he would most likely offer me every single thing in his fridge. If he thought I was even the tiniest bit cold, he would immediately give up his jacket. He was the absolute image of love. In this journal that I'm reading from, I have written many prayer requests. And one that I've written down is from February 27, 2019, from after a trip to Oklahoma with my family. And it asked that granddad would live a long and happy life because I know he told me he just wanted to make it past 80. While the prayer was answered sooner than I was hoping, I can 100% that granddad, or that God answered it. And with this, I know that, uh, sorry, it was... I know that God is not finished with him either. I can confidently say that Granddad still has an eternity of happiness to look forward to. I want to leave you with this verse today, Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. God was carrying granddad even as he struggled to find his final breaths. And 
as he is carrying us all today with the promise that we can see granddad again one day. Let's rejoice and strive to fill up heaven. Mm -hmm. I miss you, angel. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to share? Any of the grandkids? Kids? Well, thank you so much, Carson, Barrett, Cody, for sharing. Miss Darlene, you have a gracious husband. Gracious is going to be my word for him. He made all of our lives better, and I've had the privilege for the last, I don't know, 10, 11 years to be your pastor. We've been through some good times, and we've been through some challenging times. <laughs> but you guys have been faithful and supportive through it all, and I just, I love you dearly. This church loves you. To Cindy and Randy Craig and Michelle, to Chris and Deanna. We love your father. We love him dearly. He touched so many hearts, and I know that you're proud, and you should be. But also want to give a little credit, because uh, I think Barrett called it, what you call it, stubbornness? What, what, some, there are some qualities that I see that have been talked about today that have been passed on because I've got a picture if you'll show the picture of Chris and Ed in the hospital I'm assuming this is right when your doctor said he's not going to discharge Ed to come home but was going to discharge him into a skilled nursing facility which would mean during this COVID uh 19 problem this virus that nobody would go be able to go visit him well chris said no that's not going to work for us so with the help of the fire chief commandeered an ambulance and broke his dad out of the hospital to the cheers and applause of all the nursing staff i'm assuming it's while the doctor was not there uh, but you've become one of my new heroes i just want you to know that uh, to all the grandchildren You've spoken about how incredible your grandfather was and how he wanted to be at your games. He makes me want to be a better grandfather. To the great-grandchildren, you've got an awesome great-grandfather who exemplified the heart of Jesus. You are loved. And Starla and I and this church family, we loved your husband, your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather. We loved him dearly. And as it has been said, he was your biggest cheerleader. And you know what? I, I felt the same way myself. Uh, I don't want to take away from anything that he made you feel because that's unparalleled without a doubt. But he had a way of making people around him feel special, feel loved. And uh, he loved this church. He loved his pastor. He loved my family. And uh, my wife, she's, she's kind of crazy. She's back there. But uh, she would always come up to Ed on Sundays, and she would start dancing. She likes to dance. And Ed would start moving, and uh, he was going to dance with her. He never turned down the opportunity to dance a little bit. And my daughter, who's sitting over there, would always come up and kiss him on the cheek. And I don't think he minded that at all. Uh, but... Uh, he also, he just, he as has been mentioned today, loved football. Maybe got a little too invested from time to time in the games. Couldn't hold his comments to himself. Maybe when somebody wasn't playing well, the ref wasn't calling it well. But we all get a pass at those kind of games, right? Uh, and I loved the fact that I could come in on Sunday and I could talk football with Ed Beck. Now, we talked Jesus, too, but we talked football. And what I loved even more is that Ed had a grace for me, which I'm asking you to have a grace for me as a Longhorn fan. He had a grace for me. And over the last few years, you know, he would find the 
the good things on a bad football weekend. And over the last few years, we've had more bad weekends than OU has. But he would always find the good. And he wouldn't rub it in like a lot of my other OU church members. Uh, Gracious, gracious. That's the word I would use to describe Ed Beck. He was gracious with his time and his commitment to this church serving Uh, on our board and serving he and Darlene, making sure our senior adult ministry stayed active and planned. And uh, he was gracious. He was gracious with Darlene's time, even after uh, she would serve on our board and even now presently as an elder. He was gracious with his compliments, always passing out compliments. He was gracious to others around him. Maybe except when he got caught up at those games. But again, that's, we, can, we can overlook some of that. He was gracious with his love. I would walk out every single Sunday morning when I would come out from the office in towards the sanctuary for our first service. He would always be sitting in the coffee shop. And uh, I'd make my way over and I'd get a hug. And with his little raspy voice, he would always say, I love you, Pastor. I love you, Pastor. And I'd always get an I love you from Ed Beck. And uh, oftentimes he would, he would compliment a sermon that I preached. But I thought of something here just a couple of months ago. I mean, it couldn't have been more than two or three months ago. Darlene must have been out serving. And Ed was sitting right over here in this section by himself. And, and I just, in the middle of my message, I just said, isn't that right, Ed? He's looking right at me. And he didn't respond. I said, isn't that right, Ed? And he didn't respond. And I realized that moment, Ed didn't hear what I was saying. (laughs) But he had a smile on his face, and I wouldn't know it. And I I started thinking, all those times he complimented my sermon. Did he actually hear it? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. But he was gracious. He was gracious. And he loved his Lord, he loved his family. Ed was a big, imposing figure. When he walked in a room, he could command a room just by his physical stature. But yet, what you sensed was gracious. I want to be like that. I want to be like that. The book of Psalms says, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious. Joel 2.13 says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Psalm 67, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Isaiah says, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Ed was just gracious and that's the way God is and that's the way I want to be. But I want to challenge you to remember. You know, it's It's good to remember. And and what's beautiful about our memory, for the most part, we have an opportunity to be able to edit our memory. We can choose, for the most part, what we want to think about and what we want to remember and what we want to forget. Oftentimes, as we get a little older, our memory edits itself and uh, not in ways that we prefer, but we just forget some things. But for the most part, you can remember what you want. I want to challenge you to remember the good things. Remember the good times. Talk about them often. Mention Ed Beck's name often because the mention of someone's name keeps them alive in our hearts. So how can the dead be truly dead when they are still alive in the souls of those who love them? So remember, remember often. But also I want to remind you that the 81 years that Ed spent here on this life Although that is above average, and that just speaks of Ed. He's above average, without a doubt. 81 years here on this earth, that's not all there is. I want to remind you, this isn't all there is, and today is not goodbye. Today is simply, I'll see you later. Because we know where Ed is, and we will see him again. The journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all have to take. And if we're trusting in our Lord and Savior, then it leads us to a better place that he has his plan that he wants each and every one of us to share in. 
So we need to remind ourselves that when Ed took his last breath here on this earth, he took his first breath in heaven and Jesus was waiting there to receive him without a doubt. In fact, John talks about that in John chapter 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, but believe in God. Believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Meaning, this isn't all there is. There's more. Now, there's a lot of things I don't understand, and there's a lot of things we all don't understand. I don't understand why some people live long lives and others' lives are cut short. I don't understand why good men and good women are taken early. I don't understand why some people uh, are healed and others are not. But there's a lot of other things I don't understand that I don't seem to question. I, I don't understand the grace and the goodness of God that looks beyond my faults and loves me anyway. But I don't question it. I'm thankful for it. I, I don't understand how his comfort and his peace can be strength for me in troubled times, but yet I receive it anyway. And I don't understand how I can give my burdens to Jesus and he carries them for me, but I give them to him anyway and I let him carry them. So just because I don't understand certain things don't mean that I don't take advantage of them. Psalm 61 says, from the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. In other words, I can cry out to God and he takes me to a place that's above my ability to understand. So we can remind ourselves when there are things that we don't understand and we can't seem to make all the pieces fit, and we can't seem to get all the right answers for the questions that are rolling through our mind, we can cry out to God when our heart is overwhelmed. He leads us to a rock that is higher than I, a place that is above our ability to understand. And we can understand that Jesus is there offering us a promise that's beyond this world, a promise of life everlasting. He's our peace that passes all understanding. He's our calmness in the storms. He's our hope in times of despair, our strength when we are weak. We've got to remember and we've got to remind ourselves. But then there's one last thing I would challenge you to do. And maybe it seems odd in a setting, in a moment like this, but I want you to rejoice. Rejoice in the fact it's not in pain anymore. He's not suffering anymore. He's not hurting anymore. He lived his life for Christ. He was faithful to the end. He's home with his Lord. He crossed the finish line. He scored the ultimate touchdown. He heard the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He's walking the streets of gold. He's reunited with family and friends that have gone before. He's completed his mission. He's run his race. He's made it to his mansion. He's probably hanging OU memorabilia in it as we speak. We know where he is. And we can see him again. For those that trust in Christ, we will see him again. You know, I used to feel a little awkward for years in a moment like this when I know emotions are high and maybe people's hearts are a little vulnerable to make an appeal to trust in Christ. But I'll never forget standing by the, the bed of my father on the last day before he was on this earth. And as he was passing from this life to the next, he said, Kendall, tell people about Jesus. Because when his life was ending, the most important thing to him was that people knew Jesus. And the most important thing any single one of us could ever know is Jesus. And even those watching this service online from Oklahoma or around this DFW area, trust in Jesus. That's the thing that has made this season of Ed's life and his passing to the next life manageable, is knowing that he trusted in Jesus and seeing that same trust and that same confidence and that same belief lived out in his family. It is so comforting, so rewarding. 
And I would encourage everyone to put your trust in Jesus. It's as simple as admitting you're a sinner, and that's not that difficult. We all know we've sinned. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's usually not that difficult. But confessing Him as your Lord becomes the sticking point because then we have to surrender our will for His will. But that's when you know that you've stepped into a new life in Christ when you've surrendered your life to His and you've put your trust in Him. And I challenge you to do that today. Let's pray. Father, I recognize that in moments like this, You use these opportunities to get our attention. Because more important than life and days here on this earth will be our life and our days in eternity with you. So I'm asking you to prepare our hearts for that day. Prepare each and every one of us and help us come to the place of surrender and help us to come to the place of confidence and trust in you so that when we take our last breath here on this earth, we will take our first breath in heaven with you, that we will be welcomed by you, that we will hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray for the peace of God to rest upon this entire family, knowing that today and in the days ahead will be seasons of an emotional roller coaster. And we'll need you stronger on one day than we might on the next. But Lord, we lean upon you. And I'm asking you to to be the strength that each and every one needs today. I pray for my precious sister Darlene. Lord, I know that life will be difficult and life will be different. But you've promised to be there with us every step of the way. You promised to never leave us and never forsake us. And I know that you will be with Darlene every day. You'll be with the children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren. And you will be the present help that we need for each difficult day we face. We trust you. Thank you for giving us Ed Beck, who has made our lives better. Thank you for enriching our lives with every day you allowed us to share with this dear brother. May we continue to live our lives in a way that the same can be said about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you do me a favor and stand? And Bear is going to lead us in a song that has been requested that we sing.
to the Oragi cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And that old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old someday for a crown and to that old rugged cross I will never be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear and he'll call me someday to my home far his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the
we love you, each and every one of you. Even those we just have been able to meet through this, we love you. And Darlene and to all of the family, we want you to know that we're here with you every step of the way and will continue to be. Uh, as we conclude the service today, I do again want to thank the Frisco Fire Department for being here. You guys are amazing. Your representation uh, has been so encouraging to the family. Uh, when we dismiss here, we do have lunch provided for the family in the coffee shop uh, right out of the sanctuary doors. And uh, we'll reconvene there and give those that are here a chance to be able to share and uh, share their condolences with the family. But if you do me a favor, stand. And Lord, I pray for your continued peace, your continued strength, and your continued presence in our lives. Just as you promised, you'd never leave us, never forsake us. You'd go with us and be the strength that we need for each and every day. We lean upon that and trust in that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.